listen to me carefully. How many people would consider yourself religious? If you do, raise your hand. Okay, those of you that raised your hands, I'm going to offend you this morning. Those of you that didn't raise your hands, you're either going to hell because you lied or, or whatever. But I, I'm going to offend you. You need to hear me say that right up front. If you consider yourself religious, you had your warning. You will be offended today by my sermon, okay? Got it? All right. So I've told part of this story many times. Some of you heard it before. For some of you, it may be brand new. But I want to tell the whole story this morning. Back when I was working with the biker ministry, we were doing our best to hang out in the midst of some of the baddest guys and ladies you'd ever see in your life. Some of these people are habitual offenders. Some of these people are rowdy to the point that they just as soon punch you in the face as look at you. They call themselves the one presenters, and the one presenters are that for this reason. The American Motorcycle Association, back in the 19, early 1960s, said 99% of people who ride a motorcycle are outstanding citizens. And so the one percenters said, yeah, we're the other one. We're that one percent. We're not outstanding. Get out of our way. Don't bother us. Don't jack with us. We'll jack with you harder. So we're convinced that even people like that need Jesus. So we spent several years, about seven years total, working in and around the one percenter bikers. And uh, one day, I was, um, one Sunday afternoon, I went to what's called a swap meet. And a swap meet is where everybody brings their, their junk motorcycle parts together and swaps it for other people's junk motorcycle parts. And really, it's just an excuse to go outside and smoke dope or get drunk. But that's where they were, so I was there. There was a guy in the Desperados Motorcycle Club, a 1% club, who um, his biker name is Tiny. And Tiny was called Tiny because he's about 6'8", 400, 450 pounds. Tiny is anything but Tiny. And Tiny was covered in tattoos. He had all kinds of piercings. He had his nose pierced, his ears pierced, his tongue pierced, and body parts below his neck pierced, if you follow what I'm saying. Um, anyway, T Tiny was big and bad as they come. When he walked in a room, you knew Tiny was there. And uh, at some point during the afternoon, Tiny walked up to me. I was talking to some other people, and he kind of did this to me. But what he did was his hip hit me in the head, basically. Cause, and I looked at him, and in his gruff voice, he goes, I want to talk to you. Well, at that moment, my life flashed before me because my brain automatically went into, what did I do to offend him? What did I say? What did I, who, who, who was I talking to? Was I doing the wrong thing? Did I not show etiquette? I mean, there's all these rules in the biker world, and my brain is just fast-forwarding through all this stuff. And I went, okay. And he says, not here. And I'm like, well, where is he going to take me? He goes, outside. At that point, my heart rate goes up, and I know he's going to take me outside, and punch me and I don't know why and so we got outside and he's looking around the parking lot for people and he goes not here in the back well at that point I'm figuring I will just disappear no one will ever see me again dawn will cry and miss me my children will miss me my face will be on milk cartons have you seen this person and we went around back and he went not here I was at the corner of the building. He wanted to be in the back of the building, in the middle of the building. <coughs> so by that time, I'm sure I'm shaking. We get back there, and I'm just, I'm preparing myself for the worst. And he looks at me, and he goes, I want you to pray for my grandma. And I went, uh, 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 uh okay. And I said, well, what, what's wrong? He goes, she's sick. You need to pray for her. And I went, okay, let's pray right now. He goes, no, I don't pray. You're going to pray. I'm going to walk away. And I went, okay. And so he walked away, and I prayed for his grandma. Then I prayed for me, and then I prayed for Pastor D. Wayne. And I'm wondering, how long should I stay back here to make him think I prayed long enough for his mama so he won't kill me? 
and uh, or his grandma rather, and I stayed back there a good long time, and then I came back, and every now and then he'd look at me, but he wouldn't say anything, he never said another word to me the rest of the day, and I felt like I was on trial, and praise God, I didn't see him again for a long time, didn't see, I, but I did pray for his grandma, <clears throat> and then I, I, I worked a, uh, a poker run. In the biker world, let me explain this. Poker runs are just an excuse to raise cane and drink, okay? What they do is you go to a designated bar, and you get one card. You're going to play five-card stud. You get one card. So while you're drawing that one card, you're drinking, you're acting bad, you're, you know, being big and bad bikers, and then at some point they decide it's time to go get the next card. So you get on your motorcycles and ride 30 or 40 miles to another bar, where they continue to drink, and at some point they will draw a second card. You get the drift. They do this to five different bars, okay? Now, about the third bar, I happened to see Tiny, and I made sure that, that the guys I was riding with, we hung at the back because there was like 100 bikes in this processional. You know, we're going to hang at the back. Tiny's kind of at the front. He won't see me. We're blending in. Life is great. Um, but about the fourth bar... While I'm trying to hide, and it's dark in the bar, while I'm trying to hide, um, Tiny sees me, and here he comes again. I want to talk to you outside. And I'm like, crap, what have I done now? And so we go outside, and again, it's the same thing, not here, around back. And we end up in the back, back there, behind this bar with a bunch of empty kegs and all this stuff. And here's what he said to me. I don't go to church. I'm like, you don't? <laughs> I don't go to church. But if I did, I'd go to yours. You're the real deal. My grandma got healed. <sighs> Thank you, God. I get to live another day. Life is good. Here's my thought, though. As scared as I was of tiny... I would rather hang out with a hardcore, cussing, drinking, kick your butt for looking wrong guy than some of the people I know that claim they're Christians, that claim they're self-righteous, that claim they're better than everybody else, that claim they've got something and because they've got it, they are better. I'd rather hang out with the old bikers any day. We're in a series that I started four weeks ago. I'm calling it the 23rd Psalm, The Shepherd. And what we've been doing over the last four weeks is we've been walking through, quite honestly, at a very slow pace, this idea of the 23rd Psalm. It's a famous psalm. It is uh, probably one of the most famous passages of Scripture in the whole Bible. In terms of poetry, it's probably one of the most famous poems in all of history written by King David, and we've been looking at this psalm, and what we've discovered is in this psalm, there's actually six realities of life and the shepherd's role in each one of those realities. And so we started the series off uh, four weeks ago now talking about worry, and the fact is that we worry. We spend our lives worrying about stuff we can't fix or change, and we also spend a great deal of time worrying about stuff we can fix and never fix it. We'd get off our butt and stop worrying about it and go fix it and we'd be fixed. But that's how we live our lives. We also, in the process of this series, we talked about what it means to relax. What it means to have real relaxation. And also, in the process of this series, we talked about last week the idea of restoration. What it means to be restored. And I, I guess you can tell by what I've told you so far, this, this morning we're going to talk about righteousness. And what does it mean to be a righteous person? And what is real righteousness? Uh, based on that, according to what Psalm 23 has said. And um, every week we've been reading it. So let me ask you, how many of you brought your Bibles this morning? Hold them up. Old school's got pages and covers. New school's got screens. I love that. I promised you that every week we were going to read this psalm in a different translation. And last week, we were looking at it in the New Living Translation. This morning, what I'm doing is we're going to look at it from the Living Bible, which is, gives a total different spin on, 
on, on this psalm, but I love some of the things I see in it. So on the screens, follow along with me. This is Psalm 23 from the Living Bible. It says, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. He lets me rest in a meadow grass and leads me beside quiet streams. He gives me new strength. He helps me do what honors him the most. Even when I walk through a dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me, guarding, guiding all the way. You provide delicious food for me in the presence of my enemies. You have welcomed me as your guest. Blessings overflow. Your goodness and unfailing kindness shall be with me all of my life. And afterwards, I will live with you forever in your home. I kind of like that translation. It kind of expands on some of the some of the parts of it. But, you know, in this series, we've also established that the shepherd has a role. Anybody remember what the shepherd's role is? Guide, provide, correct, and protect. Absolutely. What did I say about us as sheep last week? Do you remember? When, when the Bible calls us sheep, we think it's a compliment. It ain't a compliment because sheep are stupid. Do you understand sheep would starve to death without a shepherd leading them to green pasture? Sheep would stay in the same place, and after all the grass was gone, they'd do something like this. All right, what do we do now? I don't know. What should we do? I don't know. And before they could figure it out, they'd be dead without the shepherd to guide them. So the Bible calls us sheep. I guess, to be honest, it's because we need guiding. That's probably why the Bible calls us sheep. But we know that's just only one role of the shepherd because he guides provides, corrects, and protects. Okay. All right. So we got that established. So let's look at this today. By the way, so I said something else last week. I forgot to say this to first service, but I think this is important. This is one of those things I think you need to write down and put on your refrigerator. And that's the only way the Lord can be our shepherd is if the shepherd is our Lord. Okay, and that's a that's an important thing. The only way the Lord can be our shepherd is if the shepherd is our Lord. All right. Today, we're going to focus. We're moving forward on the last half of the third verse. That's all we're going to look at. All right. The last half of the third verse, I gave it to you from the uh, the New Living Translation uh, in, in your outlines. It says he guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. We've already established the fact that the shepherd is our guide and that we need him as our guide. But when we look at this, I think it's important that we're talking about stuff that's important. Right paths. King David says right paths. That's righteousness, okay? So what King David is talking about is the fact that the shepherd guides us towards eternal life. That's what the shepherd's actually doing. In fact, here's how Jesus put it. I put this in your outline. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 says, But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So I look at that, and I figure, here's the deal. Here's what Jesus is saying here. If you want to go to heaven, if you have any hope of going to heaven, then your righteousness, your righteousness has to surpass that of the smartest, most religious, most legalistic people that ever walked on the face of this earth. If you want any hope of going to heaven. That's what Jesus said. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Your righteousness has to be better than their righteousness. If you want to go to heaven. So in my little brain, all of a sudden that clicks a question for me. And that question is, how can my righteousness be better than theirs? 
how can my righteousness be of a higher quality than theirs? Because I've done a lot of research on the Pharisees. They were some sharp people. I mean, they followed the law. Oh, my gosh. I mean, they knew the law to start with. And they literally, it was like a line down in the, in the, in the ground, and they stayed right on that line. <coughs> they didn't do anything that God didn't tell them to do. They didn't do anything. They didn't deviate from any piece of the law whatsoever. And when it came to tithing, these guys understood tithing. They understood that God got the first 10% of everything they had. Of their wealth, God got the first 10%. Of their livestock, God got the first 10%. Of their, their crops, God got the first 10%. It's even said that Pharisees tithed one-tenth of the mint leaves from their mint plants in their garden. So, that's pretty righteous. But my righteousness has to be better than that? I got to do outdo them dudes to go to heaven. That's what Jesus said. That's what he said. And I really thought about how, to, how, how does that work? And here's what I came to the conclusion of. He says it's got to be a better righteousness. It has to be a righteousness of a better kind. It's not a righteousness that's based on keeping the rules. It's not a righteousness that's based on walking this line in the sand and not deviating to the left and not deviating to, to the right. It's not that kind of righteousness at all. It's a righteousness that's based on having a personal relationship with the only perfect person that walked on this planet, Jesus. That's the kind of righteousness it has to be. So today what I want to do is I want to invest a few minutes into this issue. So I want to talk about this idea of religion versus relationship and having a righteousness that God accepts. So we're talking about religion. So let's start to me, the best place to start is with a definition of religion. What is religion? What is religion? Regardless if we're talking about Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, whatever it is, what is this idea of religion? What is religion? And I put it in your outline. Here's a definition of it. Man's attempt to please God by adhering to a set of rules and regulations. And I thought it was interesting I looked up this word religion. It actually doesn't have a Greek root. It doesn't have a Hebrew root. Its root actually comes from Latin, okay? And the word is religio. And I thought it was interesting. I looked up the definition. You ain't never going to believe the definition of that word. How we got religion out of it, at first glance, it just amazes me. The word religio means to tie or bind together, to tie or bond together, semicolon, bondage, bondage. In fact, religio is the same root word that we get the English word bondage from. So it doesn't matter if it's Hinduism, it doesn't matter if it's Buddhism, it doesn't matter if it's Christianity, it doesn't matter if it's Judaism. If you're following a religion, you are bound, you are tied up, you're in bondage. Now hear me, if you don't get anything else out of anything I say today, listen to this. Jesus did not come to put you in bondage. He came to set you free. He came to give you life and that life be more abundant. So how do we relate the two? How did we ever call Christianity and what we understand as Christianity to be a religion? Because it never was intended to be a religion. So how do we get there from here? So I thought about this. The best place in the Bible that I have ever found 
to, to kind of talk about this, believe it or not, is in the New Testament. Believe it or not, it's in one of the epistles, one of the letters that Paul wrote to the churches. Okay? And here's the deal. He wrote his letter to the church at Galatia, the churches at Galatia, and we know of it as the book of Galatians in the New Testament. Now, the churches at Galatia, they got all wrapped around the axle when it comes to religion, okay? And Paul writes his letter to them to try to set them straight. Let me, let me give you a little bit of background. Galatia, the ancient city of Galatia, is, is in a region that is now part of the country of Turkey, okay? And in Galatia, Paul traveled there during one of his missionary journeys. And when he was in Galatia, he started planting churches, not just one. It's not just one church in Galatia. It's a group. It's a cluster of churches. Some theologians think up to 20. Others think eight. I don't know that it really matters that we know the number. It was multiple churches. And Paul planted every one of them. And once he planted them, he put somebody in charge of that local church, just like he did Timothy, just like he did Titus. He had people in charge. And then Paul left to do what it was Paul did, to go plant more churches and to share the gospel. After Paul left, a group of people literally, it kind of feels like, but not really, that they invaded the churches at Galatia. A group of people started attending those churches, all of them with the same mindset. We refer to them as Judaizers. You ever heard that term before? Okay, they were Judaizers. That's a word that was made up 2,000 years later when we defined these people. But it was a group of people that started coming to these churches. Now, these were not bad people. These were people, most of them were Jews. That's why we call them Judaizers, all right? Most of them were Jews, but they were Jews who believed Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that God sent Jesus to the earth for the express purpose of dying on the cross, being buried, and rising again on the third day. They believed that he was the Messiah. Nothing wrong with that, right? It's like so far, we're tra everybody's tracking, right? Here's where it changes. They also believed strongly in what they were brought up to believe, which was... Judaism. And so when Paul left, what these guys came in the church and said, having Jesus as the Messiah is good, but it ain't enough. Not only do you have to believe Jesus was the Messiah, but you have to follow all the tenets, all the rules, all the rituals of Judaism if you ever think you're going to go to heaven. Hmm. Hmm. That kind of adds a new spin to it, doesn't it? That kind of that kind of changes the playing field just a little bit, right? Well, what do you think Paul did when he heard about this? Wow. Wow. He gets word of this, and to say he was a little upset would be an understatement. I could tell you what he was, but even I don't talk that way in church, okay? I mean, but that's what he was. He was ticked. He was fired up, okay? He, he sets down while he's angry, and he writes this letter to the churches at Galatia. Now, understand something. When we talk about Paul, we're talking about a dude that was the very best Pharisee anybody could ever be before he met Jesus, right? He was the Pharisees, Pharisees. He kept the law better than anybody ever kept the law. In fact, he knew it better than anybody else. You understand, I've told you guys this before, to be a Pharisee, not only do you have to know the law, you have to be able to quote the law word for word. To be a Pharisee, you, were, you had to quote the first five books of the Old Testament verbatim. And that's what Paul could do. He knew the Ten Commandments and the 613 other laws that were added to the Ten Commandments by man. He knew all of that. He knew about every ceremony, every ritual, everything there was to know. And in fact, at one point, he hated, he dedicated his life 
to wiping out this whole belief system called the way, which was what the early church was called. He knew they were wrong. He knew that the Messiah had not come. He knew that they were horrible at what they were doing, and he dedicated his life to wipe this whole movement off the face of the earth. In fact, he signed off on the stoning of Stephen. The Bible says he stood there and held the coats of the dudes who threw the rocks at Stephen and approved of it. He hated Christians. He hated what they stood for. But then everything changed on the road to Damascus when he saw Jesus, when he met Jesus. His whole life changed. His whole life literally was turned upside down. In fact, it started the journey for him to become what is considered the most effective missionary in all of history. And probably one of the greatest Christians to ever walk on this planet. So you can imagine when word got to him that this group of people had infiltrated the churches that he planted, that he had shared the gospel with, and now they were abandoning their freedom in Jesus and agreeing to take on this bondage of Jesus plus this other stuff, right? I mean, you can imagine what he thought. And let me ask you, can we just acknowledge for just the purposes of acknowledging that there's still a lot of people like that today? There is. Churches like yours and our, yours and mine right here at Thrive Church, we get our fair share of what I would call modern Judaizers walking through the doors of our church. I heard a story this week that I thought was amazing. Somebody who goes here. And works out at Planet Fitness about three days a week. <clears throat> Six months ago, whatever it was, he's working out at Planet Fitness. He kept noticing the same guy there, same time he was there every day. You know, uh, kind of following the same routine. He'd be on the, the treadmill or he'd be on the elliptical trainer and this guy's on one. He'd be walking, going through the, the circuit or doing free weights and this guy was on the circuit or doing free weights. And after three or four weeks of seeing him three or four times a day, he just decided to strike up a conversation and ask him how he was doing. And uh, one thing led to another in their conversation, and he found out that this guy was a Christian. And he said, well, you know, so am I. And for whatever reason, the second guy thought because he said he was a Christian, that gave him a license to start bashing everything. And he said, I tell you what, I am so fed up with these modern churches. They just perverted the gospel of Jesus. They don't care about nothing that's sacred anymore. They've gotten a rid of the God-ordained piano and organ in the church. And they got a, a stinking rock band playing in church on Sunday morning with drummers like Keith Harrell like we have. Oh, my gosh. They're playing music to be better off be playing it in a bar instead of a church on Sunday morning. And pastors, all they want to do is water the gospel down. They don't have any decency or consideration for God whatsoever. They don't even wear suits anymore to church. In fact, I heard some preacher here in Portsmouth all summer long, he was wearing flip-flops and t-shirts and shorts to preach, and I guarantee you his sermons were watered down. And the guy says, by the way, where do you go to church? And the guy said, I go to Thrive over on Portsmouth Boulevard. He said, the guy turned around and walked away from him. Walked away from him. And you know, I thought about this. This was hilarious. I've had a hardcore cussing, drinking, fighting, maybe even killing biker toast me while some so-called religious Christian roasted me. Who do I want to hang out with? I'd rather hang out with Tiny any day of the week because he's kind of proved to me he won't kill me. I don't know about that Christian dude. But, you know, we got it in the church today, guys. It ain't, it's not limited to Galatia. We got it in the church today. Some problems, I'll tell you. I, I got to get going. I got to move on because I got a lot to cover. I want to look at four problems with a righteousness that's based on religion. 
if we have a righteousness that's based on religion, we got four problems right off the bat. I bet you there's more. These are just the ones I came up with. And the first one is this. Religion is a different gospel. Religion is a different gospel altogether, okay? That's the first thing that, that he says is religion is a different gospel. Every other letter that Paul wrote, you can look at all of them, starts off with him being so loving towards that church. I, Paul, a prisoner of the Lord Jesus, think about you every day. And are blessed by the way you're treating people. And are blessed by the way you're bringing people to Jesus. And are blessed because of your testimony in the streets. And are blessed this and that and blah, 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 blah. That's, he says that's how he starts all of his letters. Except Galatians. He don't beat around the bush in Galatians at all. When you start reading it, understanding he was mad when he wrote it. It brings a whole new light to the whole letter. So understanding that he's light, let's he's fight, he's he's angry. Let's let's look at this. Starting with Galatians chapter one. I'll tell you, verse one says, I Paul, being a prisoner of Christ. Okay, because that's the way he started all his letters. But look what he did. Verse two, and then I'll give you verse six and seven, just to get an idea of his anger. He said, To the churches at Galatia. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. He didn't waste any time. He put it right on the line. He wanted the churches to know how, how upset he was and how mad he was and how he felt about all of this. Paul's saying, dudes, I am shocked. I am shocked. Don't you understand that what you are considering is a different gospel than the gospel we preach to you? This is not a gospel about Jesus. You know, Jesus came to set you free from the bondage of legalism. And these people have come into the church and they have led you right back to bondage. And you didn't go kicking and screaming. You willfully went. Jesus made it abundantly clear why he came. And it wasn't for bondage. Look what Jesus said in Luke chapter 4 verses 19 and 20. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know. I tell you what bugs me is that the Galatians, they weren't the only ones doing this. I dare say people right now, right here, even in this room, are struggling with this idea of freedom versus bondage. I mean, some people, they come to Jesus and they start off well. I mean, they're, they, they understand they're moving towards this freedom that Jesus gives us. But at some point along the way, they allowed things to get in their life that's captured their heart. And as they do that, Jesus is becoming less and less important to them. And for other people, they're stepping towards legalism. Their life was transformed by the power of Jesus. You know, they started out exciting about uh, excited about their relationship with Jesus. They were on fire for Jesus. They were blown away by his love for them. But then if they're honest, they're 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 drifting to moving to a place where they're thinking now it's more important to keep some set of rules or to follow some set of rituals than it is to live in the grace of Jesus. Maybe it's somebody that's watching online this morning. Maybe this sermon is for you. Maybe you need to hear this. Maybe it's for somebody in this room this morning. I mean, at one time you were on fire for Jesus. But if you're honest, now your, your life as a believer revolves around a list of do's and don'ts. Of things you should do and things you shouldn't do. Of rituals you ought to keep. 
Hear me, guys. Either way, if that's the way you're moving, you're moving towards bondage, not towards freedom. And what Paul says, if that's what you're doing, you've chosen a different gospel. You've chosen a gospel that Paul didn't preach. And, and, and if that's true, then that leads us to the second problem. The second problem is this. Faith as a religion brings confusion. Faith as a religion brings confusion. Galatians chapter 1 verse 7 says, Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. See, the folks in Galatia were allowing people to influence them. They were allowing these people that came into the church, they were allowing them to influence them. And as a result, what Paul says is they were believing a perverted version of the gospel of Jesus. You see, they were believing that it was Jesus plus something else. It was Jesus in addition to these other things. And no matter who you are, where you are, when you believe it is Jesus plus anything else, you're believing a perverted version of the gospel. Okay? Straight up. Now, and Paul, Paul said what you're believing is perverted. Allowing yourself to be influenced by these people. Allowing these people to put things in your brain that make sense. But are not according to God's word. Is a perversion of the gospel of Jesus. None of us when we heard the gospel heard it was Jesus plus anything. But a lot of us who are not careful we end up living a life where that's true. It's Jesus plus doing this. It's Jesus plus not doing this. It's Jesus plus not going there, not drinking that, not whatever. You can fill in the blank. But every time we add that to it, it becomes a perverted version of the gospel. In your outline, I've highlighted a couple of points of confusion. I just want to cover real quick. The first one is this. Religion provides a false sense of measurement. What do I mean by that? It's like this. I do this now. I find myself doing this. And every time I find myself doing it, I have to get on my knees and say, God, forgive me. But I do it. I'll do something stupid. I'll do something crazy. I'll do something wrong. And I realize I've done it wrong. I realize I said the wrong thing. The actions were wrong. Whatever it was, right? So in order to fix that, I'll come over here and do something even better than that was worse or so when the, me- when the scale is measured, there's more good on the good than the bad, right? I do that. You do that if you're honest, you know. And maybe it's you don't actually do it, but you think, well, if I do more good than I do bad, God's going to like me more. And there we go. We started measuring our goodness. We started measuring our salvation. The, the problem with that is that being a Christian, what we do is we have reduced it to a list of do's and a, lo- a list of don'ts, you know. Well, I don't cuss. I don't drink that much. I don't smoke dope. And I don't, don't go to strip bars anymore. So I must be a Christian. I mean, I got to be. Because I was doing all that stuff before, and I don't do it anymore. So I got to be a Christian. Listen, I, I, need, I need to warn you. Maybe that's exaggerated. But if you play that game, you're going down a road. And it's only a matter of time before you start judging the people in your life based on your standards. If the people in your life cuss, then they must not be Christians. If the people in your life drink, then they must not be Christians. If the people in your life smoke dope, then they must not be Christians. If they go to the bars, they must not be Christians. How can you say that? Because you're using your list to judge them by. We got to be careful. We got to be careful. That brings me to the second thing. 
Religion gives a false sense of security. It does. We start believing that if we get enough things right, then we're right with God. If, if, we, if we have this checklist in place and we can go down the checklist, then we're going to be right with God. And the checklist sounds something like this. My parents went to First Baptist Church all their lives, and I therefore I must be a second-generation Baptist, and I'm saved. Check. Or I go to the coolest church in Portsmouth. It's called Thrive Church. Check. Or I serve in Kids Thrive, and if anybody serves in Kids Thrive, God saves them. Check. Or... I was baptized by Pastor Pat five years ago. I'm saved. Check. And you didn't drown. I worked the trunk or treat two years in a row and gave out six million pieces of candy. Check. When we were building Children's Thrive, I gave a check to the building fund for 10 grand. Check. And that's exactly what was going on in Galatia. That's exactly what they were doing. That's what Paul found out. And he yells. He screams. He goes, whoa, dudes. These Judaizers have gotten you way off track, okay? You need to stop listening to what they're telling you. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. Keeping the rules may give us a sense of security, but if anyone tries to lead you down that path, run away from them. Because you see, the Judaizers came in with this Jesus plus approach. All you got to do is Jesus and that. Jesus and this. Jesus and the other thing. And it hasn't stopped since. We got to be careful. We got to be careful. If somebody is telling you it's what you believe about Jesus plus anything, Paul says they're cursed. They're cursed of God. Paul says faith as a religion, which is Jesus plus, is a different gospel and it brings confusion. And if anybody preaches a gospel other than Jesus died, buried, risen again, let them be cursed of God. That brings me to the third problem. I got to move on. It's already after 12. Religion focuses on the externals. It's easy to get ourselves off Jesus when we're trying to please other people. And inevitably, that's what we end up doing. And we got to be careful. We got to guard our hearts against that. Galatians chapter 110 says, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. He's saying to them, You've gotten your eyes off Jesus, and you're focusing on living. To please other people. You understand what we do when we do that? You understand, instead of leaving church on Sunday morning talking about the presence of God, instead of leaving church on Sunday morning talking about the power of the Holy Spirit in the room that day, we're talking about, man, didn't you think Dawn sang pretty this morning? Didn't you think Cynthia sang pretty this morning? And there's nothing wrong with that. Or maybe we're saying... Did you hear how powerful Pastor John prayed? And there's nothing wrong with that. Or it's saying, do you see how big the check was I put in the plate this morning? And there's nothing wrong with that. Understand me, there is nothing wrong with worship and singing. And there's nothing wrong with praying. And there's certainly nothing wrong with giving. But God doesn't care what you do. As much as he cares why you do it. You want to avoid this trap? You got to remember something. I'm a simple person. Here's the way to remember it. 
Religion is spelled capital D, little o. Relationship is spelled capital D, little o, little n, little e. Religion is all about doing. And the relationship with Jesus is all about what he's done. And that makes the difference. That makes the difference. And by the way, what he did was perfect. Nothing needs to be added to it. And nothing needs to be taken away from it. Well, Pastor, Pastor Steve, are you saying it don't matter how we live? I didn't say that. I most certainly did not say that. What I said was the relationship of Christianity is about how you live to please the one. The one being God. Here's how Paul put it, Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for its righteousness could be gained through the law. Christ died for nothing. If righteousness, the ability to go to heaven, could be gained through keeping the law, doing the do's and don't do the don'ts, then Jesus died in vain. He died in vain. He's saying, why did Jesus endure the pain of the cross then? Why did he do that? Listen. When you get that, when that clicks for you, everything changes. Everything. See, I want to be faithful to God, not because I have to. But because it's a way of saying thank you for what you've done. Let me make that a little bit easier to understand. I want to be faithful to Dawn as my wife. Not to keep her. But to say thank you to her for putting up with me for 43 years. My life. Becomes driven with the desire. To make Jesus proud, not Joe or Tom or Sue. And, and not as a means of being with him, but as a thanks for his free gift, gift that allows me to be with him. I love what Paul said next, and that brings me to the final problem. We've got to wrap up. Number four, religion blocks the power of the relationship. Religion blocks the power of relationship. See, the religious get so focused on a false sense of security from keeping the rules and doing the do's and not doing the don'ts that they get this sense of self-worth that's actually a ba a based on the applause of man, not of God. Paul reminds them of his history before he met Jesus. In Galatians chapter 1, this is verses 13 through 16. He says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how in intensely I persecuted the church of God <clears throat> and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my own people, and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him to the Gentiles. Paul said, I was as religious as they come, but then I met Jesus. And when I met Jesus, everything else changed. God called me by his grace. Guys, listen, listen. You get this right? You'll never be religious again. And you can, I can guarantee you everything's going to change in your life. Because the change isn't an external change. The change is an internal heart change. You know, think about it. That's the story of my life. I mean, I used to be this, thinking that I had to do the do's and not do the don'ts. But when I recognized God's grace, everything changed my marriage was headed for divorce but I recognized God's grace 
and everything changed. My finances were in the toilet, but I recognized God's grace and everything changed. You and I can say this. My life was blank. You filled me with blank. But God called me by his grace. Some of you here today are hurting. I know. Uh, wondering, literally wondering if you've done enough. If you took your last breath on this planet today, have you done enough to please God? Have you done enough to cause God to love you? Listen to me. God will never love you any more than he loves you right now. And he'll never love you any less than he loves you right now. And don't ever get caught in the trap that you got to do something to earn his love. When actually, in reality, it was the other way around. He did something to earn your love. He died for you. I hate religion. I don't want to ever be labeled as a religious anything. And maybe that's why I try to act different from any pastor you've ever seen. Don't put me in a box. Don't put me in a box. I'd rather spend time with Tiny than anybody who thinks they're religious. You want to go to heaven? Your righteousness has to surpass that of the Pharisees. Galatians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. We live in a rule, in a world, guy, where... In a, we live in a world... Where guys are not impressed by our rules. We live in a world where people aren't impressed with our rituals. You see, they're desperate to believe something real. They're desperate to know that somebody cares about them. I think the one thing that you and I have common with every person that's homeless today is this. Just like them, we need Jesus. We need be the people who help other people realize somebody cares about them. We need to be the people that help them realize it's not a religious issue at all. It's not doing the do's and not doing the don'ts. It's having a relationship with the only perfect person that ever walked on this planet. That's the difference between religion and relationship. Give me the relationship any day. Let's pray. God, you're amazing. I thank you that you're not about rules and requirements. And rituals. Because you know I can't keep rules. I can't keep requirements. And I can't keep rituals. But I can know your son died for me. And I can accept that he went to that cross for my sin. And I know that he rose again on the third day. And he set it, seated at your right hand. And I want that relationship, that relationship that says, I'm yours. Jesus plus nothing, just Jesus. Thank you, Father, for it is in the name of Jesus that we pray this morning. Amen.